Okay, everyone, I think we can start. We are already recording. So I will probably leave the camera like this so that you can see the audience, Felipe. Uh, if the internet is not very good, I will probably switch this camera off, okay? Uh, it is a great pleasure to have my friend Felipe from the uh, Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla. So he works in the Grains Lab uh, in, uh, in the Physics Institute. And he's going to give an overview of all the uh, work that he's been doing in the, in the past few years involving granular materials. It was uh, a pity that Felipe couldn't make to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to our workshop, but uh, he will come in another opportunity for sure. But he will be here with us today in the video. So we are going to see how things, uh, the things that he is doing uh, 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 in his lab. Okay. So Felipe, it's, yes. it's, you can start, you have the, uh, the, the word now, go ahead. Uh, it's very nice to have you here. Thank you very much, Yuri. Okay. Well, uh, as uh, Yuri explained, I'm coming from the Institute of Physics of the Autonomous University of Puebla in Mexico. And, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Yuri for the opportunity to present my work in this uh, summer workshop. Uh, even when it is in mathematics, but I'm more uh, working only in topics uh, uh, related to physics. Okay, so anyway, we need physics, uh, mathematics everywhere. <laughs> so uh, just let me show you very quickly a view from my university. This is the main campus at, uh, at, uh, in the city of, of Puebla. So I think Puebla is more or less uh, of the same population than Brasilia about uh, 5 million people, and this is the main campus. But my laboratory is not here. It's uh, 20 minutes uh, by car from, from the city in a place that is called Valsequillo because of the lake that you can see over here. And uh, my laboratory is here in this lab, uh, in this building that is Brains Lab. This is the website of my, of my laboratory. If you want to see more details about the research we are performing, uh, where you will find uh, some uh, papers related to granular materials, for instance, uh, experiments about cratering and ray systems. Uh, very quickly, just, uh, 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 well, I, I'm going to mention that we have studied, for instance, recently, the formation of ray systems that are these strike lines coming from the point of impact and in the Tycho crater in the moon, on the surface of the moon, and we perform some experiments uh, with non-spherical projectiles, so amorphous projectiles. And we observe that the ray systems, for instance, these two that you can observe here in this part, and in this part, you can, you can see some rays, and they are produced from the concavities. If you see again the, the, the projectile, it has two concavities, one here, one over here, and one over here. And the, the ray systems are produced by the concavities of the projectiles. So probably in the case of Tycho, also the meteorite that impacted had some uh, concavities and those produce the rays that you can observe there. So we have also uh, studied recently uh, binary craters. So this is a doublet on Mars. This is a picture from NASA. And you can observe that between the two depressions, there is a, a strike ridge that is called a septum. And we are able to, well, at laboratory scale, by doing experiments with impact with two projectiles, uh, we perform some experiments and we can reproduce these depressions. And you can also observe this stride ridge at the, at the, at the, in the middle that is produced by the two uh, shock waves generated during, uh, by each impact. So they are, uh, if the impact is geometric at the same time, so the stride right, the, the, the ridge of the septum is a stride. So th this means that in this case, also the impact, for instance, was totally symmetric. But you can also change the, okay, delay one impact from the other and so op uh, overimpose one crater on the first one. You can have it uh, totally separated. Of course, if you have a large separation between the projectiles and as you decrease the separation, so you go from two well independent project uh, craters to overimposed craters, elliptical craters. And something interesting is that when the separation is very small, then you get again a 
a single crater yeah and circular with a circular ring so this is a circular crater and this is interesting because uh, astronomers were considering that it was weird that about 15 percent of the meteorites are binary systems that means there, there are two or uh, two two uh, meteorites that are falling together but only two percent of the craters that you can find in the in the surface of planets and the moon for instance they are single, uh, only two percent are uh, binary craters of this type so this can explain for instance that if the projectiles impact at the same uh, time and very close one to the other you obtain only a single crater this can be also observed that in this impact in the, the first one that i show it the part the, the projectile was totally amorphous no? and even that uh, you cannot see in the final shape of the crater information about the shape of the meteorite because the crater becomes circular so uh, probably would be something that uh, it's required now to explain is uh, how geometrically how can you generate in sand by producing a depression a, cr the, a crater that always is circular independently of the shape of the depression that you are generating and that can be studied from the point of view of topological well or probably uh, of geometry only considering the angle of repose of the grammar material well <clears throat> This is not what I want to talk with this. Uh, well, this is only a summary of our study in craters. But in this talk, I want to uh, show some, some experiments related to liquids, in particular one that is very, uh, well, I like a lot, that is a triple laden force effect. And another one that has to do with the discharge of liquid and grains from silos, when you don't have only one orifice, but when you have more orifices. So it's a mixture of liquid and grains flowing from a silo with n orifices. So let us start with the triple laden press effect. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show you, uh, this is a, you can see there, a, a aluminum plate that is at a temperature 120 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to deposit some water. And what you can see is that the droplets uh, very rapidly uh, evaporates. You know? So this is something that is a uh, quick evaporation, right? So if you increase the temperature of the plate, the aluminum plate now is at 250 degrees Celsius, probably one could expect that evaporation would be faster. But instead of that, uh, the droplets fall, they touch the plate and rapidly start uh, to, to coalesce, forming a larger droplet that moves almost without friction with the plate. So this was observed by Leiden first <clears throat> a long time ago. And in fact, this is called the Leiden press effect. And what happens is that when the water uh, touches the plate, it uh, evaporates very quickly from the bottom, producing a vapor legion, this vapor cushion, that avoids the direct impact, the direct uh, contact between the drop and the plate. Yeah? So the uh, vapor layer is an, uh, isolates the droplet. So the, the, the evaporation rate decreases considerably. And also the friction. Yeah. So the vapor is levitating on its the droplet is levitating on its own vapor. If the there is a capillary length that is the ratio between surface tension and the product of density with uh, gravity, density of the liquid by gravity, and this capillary length is a, well, it's a competition between surface tension and and the weight of the of the drop. If the surface tension domains that happens when the diameter of the droplet is smaller than the capillary length so you have uh, spherical droplets you can see here the small uh, vapor layer in laden frost and in this case you have a large laden frost droplet but because the, the diameter is la much larger than the capillary length for instance for water the capillary length is about 2.5 millimeters so this droplet is much larger than 2.5 millimeters and you can observe that it becomes a puddle so gravity domains against surface tension. And you can also observe here a vapor ledger that is about 100 micrometers. Uh, people have studied during the last uh, 20 days, uh, 20 days, 20 years, considerably the, uh, the latent process state. For instance, it has been shown 
then when to, when you have a large droplet, it has a, a star-shaped oscillation, and the number of oscillations depend on the perimeter of the droplet. So as you decrease the perimeter of the droplet, the number of oscillations decreases, for, for instance, from 13 to 10 to 8, and then it continues decreasing until it becomes totally spherical because uh, surface, tension, uh, surface tension domains. Also, it has been shown that if you put a laden frost droplet on a hot plate, but in this case, the plate is not totally flat, but with uh, some uh, zigzag uh, profile, like this uh, ratchet, yeah, the vapor that is ex expelled from the bottom of the droplet can be redirected and produce cell propulsion. And if this and, and if the if this ratchet is now uh, circular, you can generate rotation. For instance, in this video, you you can see there the ratchet, and then uh, a water drop is uh, placed on the plate, and you can observe that uh, the the droplet start rotating. Yeah. So this is a laser rotator. So this is real time, Felipe. The video. Yeah. Yes, it's real time real-time video. So okay. here you have you have another picture of uh, a droplet that is deposited on a flat plate. You can see that it's in laden first, so it's very quasi-static. And in these conditions, you can measure the, the evaporation time of the droplet as a function of the, of the temperature of the plate. And uh, of course, close to 100, the, there is a certain evaporation time for a given volume. And then for the same volume, you increase the temperature of the plate and it goes practically to zero because it evaporates very quickly, as I showed you in the first video. And then when you reach a temperature, uh, a certain temperature, there is a considerable increase in the evaporation time. So the temperature at which the evaporation time is the largest, it is called the latent first temperature. And this is the way you can obtain it for a given substrate and a given liquid. Now, uh, also people have shown that this uh, latent frost temperature can be considerably reduced when you put a liquid droplet on a hot uh, pool of another liquid. For instance, this is a pool of silicon oil. Yeah, so it's very viscous. And then it is very, when it is at around uh, 80 degrees Celsius only, and you put ethanol, because ethanol is very volatile, it can enter into latent frost on the, the, the pool of silicon. Even when the difference between the latent frost temperature, the, between the boiling temperature of ethanol and the temperature of the plate is only of eight degrees because the, the saturation temperature for, for ethanol is 72. The plate is at 80, so a small overheating only of eight degrees is able to produce latent uh, frost state on liquid pools. So all the previous studies that I just shown has to do with uh, single droplets. So one droplet of water or one droplet of liquid of oil or, or of ethanol uh, levitating on a surface of a solid plate or a pool of oil. What happens about the interaction of latent frost drops? This is a question that we just uh, wanted to, to study. And then we observed that in the literature, well, by looking at the literature, there was a, an article in Journal of Fluid Mechanics about uh, 2014, where they uh, deposit two droplets on channels that are overheated, and then the droplets uh, slide due to gravity and, co and collide at the central part of this channel. And then with a high-speed camera, they measure the collision. And they observed then after uh, upon co co uh, upon co well, following the collision, there was a coalescence of the droplets, direct coalescence of the droplets, and then the droplets jump. Because they explain there was a change of mechanical energy, kinetic energy, into uh, elastic energy. And then again, this elastic energy produced mechanical energy that uh, uh, propels the droplet producing jump. But this study was focused only in identical water droplets. So two droplets, in this case, they were water droplets of the same size. Then we uh, decided to study our, our own experiment, uh, experiment. This is the hot plate, aluminum plate. You can see the drop one at the central part here and, or, of a given liquid. And then we are going to deposit another liquid from the edge of the plate. The plate has a small, uh, 
uh, inclination, in fact, it's uh, one degree, and then the droplet will slide, colliding in the central part because there is no uh, friction because they are in latent state. So the droplet two will slide and collide with the second drop. And all the experiment is filled again with a high speed camera. We played with different uh, liquids. So you can see here the list of liquids that we use, 11 different liquids with different properties. So for instance, uh, this is the boiling temperature, its surface tension, density, viscosity, the capillary length for each liquid and the latent heat. We can notice that the values are not, for instance, for water is not 100, but this is not weird because we performed the experiment in, in Puebla. So this is the boiling temperature at 2000 uh, meters over the sea level. This is for ethanol, etc. cetera. Uh, then uh, we started by, uh, well, wondering if all these liquids have a latent for temperature. So we performed the experiment of measuring the evaporation time as a function of the plate temperature, as the first uh, plot, what I explained before. For water, there are the red points. So you can notice that the values of the evaporation time is very, uh, well, very, uh, some only seconds. And then at 200 Celsius, you reach the maximum. So this is this blue point uh, indicates the latent frost temperature for water. We repeat the experiment with all different liquids. And, and but only I'm showing the latent frost temperature. So we found that each liquid has a different latent frost temperature. You can notice the values here. For instance, for it length glycol, the latent frost temperature would be about 330 degrees. For all the alcohols, it's between 130 and 180 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And then this is the latent frost temperature. So we can plot the latent frost temperature of each liquid as a function of the boiling temperature of the corresponding liquid. Here is water for 93 degrees boiling temperature. You have a uh, latent frost temperature about 200 and for the rest of the liquids. And uh, well, uh, as a guide to the, to the eye, we put this red line that is a strike line just showing that this the temp latent frost temperature is, can probably be estimated as 1.4 times the boiling temperature plus 50 degrees Celsius. But if we can collapse, we can collapse all this data in a single cure by normalizing the temperature with the latent heat, yeah? Multiply it by the heat capacity uh, uh, at a constant pressure of the given liquid. Then you can observe here that all the points uh, collapse. Well, now we know, we know now that all the liquids have a uh, latent frost temperature. So we can study two droplets interaction with all these liquids. So we started with water-water interaction. So you can notice that after the, the collision, they di directly coalesce. If we repeat the experiment with ethanol-ethanol, direct coalescence also occurs, as in the experiment that we already know from uh, 2014. The, the article that people have studied before. But what happens now with different liquids? So here we have water, just with a, li a little bit of blue ethanol to, dis to distinguish from the other one, blue methylene, methylene blue. And then you have ethanol. And in this case, even when the liquids are miscible, because ethanol is perfectly miscible in water, they don't coalesce directly, but they start jumping one against the other. So you can see a lot of bounces. And in fact, the droplets can bounce during uh, minutes, depending on the amount of liquid that you put there. But after a lot of collisions, yeah, there is a moment when the ethanol droplet, in this case, that is bouncing, becomes very small yeah, and reaches a, a, a size at which uh, the droplet finally, you will see, coalesce. So there is a critical size for coalescence, and we observed that it was very reproducible, the size of coalescence. So we wanted to understand why there are bounces if the liquids are miscible, and why they coalesce at a given certain size. This a quick happens. question. Can yes. you hear me? So, so, so yes. you mentioned that the, uh, the uh, hot plate had an inclination of one degree. So it is a yes. conical plate so that the drops yeah. are always on the center yes exactly the, the, the idea of the ah. conical plate well to, to the eye 
to the eye, it looks almost flat because it's one degree inclination, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, a, it's practically flat. I thought the it was the whole table tilted. Yes. No, no, the, the whole table is uh, is totally horizontal. So the plate, the, the droplet is at the center because of this a small inclination of the plate. Right. The idea okay. is also to to have always the the collision at the center that you can film it with a high speed camera. No? So the mm -hmm. camera, the high speed camera is, is uh, this is a top view. So we are, uh, the, the, the high speed camera is fixed and you only observe the collisions. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you have a plate that is a plate that is totally horizontal, it would happen the same. Only that after one collision, the droplets will be displaced due to the collision, right? <laughs> Okay, so this, that is the idea. So we repeat the experiments with different uh, combinations of liquid, for instance, water and isopropanol here that are also miscible with chloroform. The chloroform is immiscible with water, but they also happen the same and with acetone. And you observe that they don't coalesce, even if they are miscible or immiscible in this case. Up to uh, the, the droplets reach a, a certain size, as you can see here with acetone and water. So again, there is the the collision at certain size when the droplet becomes very small. But there were other, other cases like this one where you have uh, water and dimethylformamide and where you observe direct coalescence. So we deposit the liquid and it never, uh, it never bounces. It always uh, coalesces directly independently of the, of the size of the droplets. So clearly uh, we had to prepare this table uh, where we have the different liquids against another droplet, droplet one versus droplet two. So W is for water, et cetera, et ethanol E, et cetera. The main diagonal uh, indicates liquids of the same nature. So this is water, water, ethanol, ethanol, et cetera. And you can see that liquids of the same nature, droplets of the same nature always coalesce directly. While water, basically uh, all the liquids rebound against water even if they are invisible, this uh, uh, subscript indicates invisible. So exan and chloroforms and toluene are invisible with water. And you can notice that most of them rebound against water, but toluene coalesce with water. So it doesn't matter if they're invisible or miscible. It's another thing that is explaining why they rebound or coalesce. Okay, so we follow the dynamics from the moment of deposition of the droplet with diameter D0 up to the moment of the coalescence with diameter DC. So you can see all the bounces uh, by this trajectory. We studied the, 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 the radius of these bounces from the, center, from the center of the plate, and we, we see that it is chaotic. So it's not because of the kinetic energy, because you can notice that at the beginning of in time, minus 20 here indicates the moment in which we deposit the liquid and zero is the time of coalescence. So it's a little bit weird to put the time like that, but it's just to indicate that the time zero corresponds to coalescence. And then here, the droplet is larger and has larger bounces, but then the, the kinetic energy is larger at the moment of collision, but they don't coalesce there. They coalesce even when the kinetic energy is smaller. You can notice also that the diameter of the droplets for each liquid uh, decreases almost linearly up to the moment of coalescence here. So we measure the diameter of the droplets at the coalescence, and it was plotted as a function of the volume of the initial droplet that we deposit. So we change the initial volume of the droplets from as very small droplets to very large droplets. And we observe that always the diameter of the coalescence was, was almost the same. This dashed line corresponds to the diameter of the, of the initial droplet. And you can see that there is a evaporation from this dashed line until the moment of coalescence that is shown with the solid points here. Also, it doesn't depend on the initial volume of the central droplet, and it didn't depend on the temperature of the plate. So, uh, well, there was a small dependence on the temperature of the plate, but it can be considered almost constant. So all this uh, give us the idea also that if you see the size of this uh, diameter, it was of the order of the capillary length. So the, the, uh, we, we said, OK, let's plot it the, the time of coalescence as a function of the difference between the boiling temperature of both liquids. For instance, if you put water against water, all these experiments are against water. 
So if you put water against water, the, the difference in temperature is zero. So the time of coalescence is basically zero. The same happens with the methyl formamide and toluene. But when the difference in temperature is uh, in this side, to the, to, the, to the right of this uh, dashed line, we observe bouncing. So this uh, gives us the idea that the important thing was the difference in temperature between the two liquids. So our hypothesis is uh, uh, illustrated in this sketch. You have the central droplet here, that is, for instance, water. So the temperature of the boiling temperature for water is 100 degrees Celsius. And you have a water too, for instance, ethanol, that is at 70 degrees Celsius. Each droplet is individually in latent process state over a hot plate at 250 degrees Celsius. So here is the vapor layer one. This is the vapor layer two. But because the water droplet has a considerable larger temperature than the uh, ethanol droplet, the ethanol also enters uh, or experiences the latent process state against the surface of the water droplet. So there is another latent frost layer here that prevents the direct contact between the droplets and then preventing coalescence. Because there are three different latent frost layers, we call this the triple latent frost state. So to show that it's easier to do it with a, with, a, with a video, but you need to see the vapor being produced during the collision. So we use ethylene glycol, that is the liquid that has the largest boiling temperature, 190 degrees Celsius. And we use chloroform, that is the liquid the smallest uh, boiling temperature, where acetone is smaller, but you can notice that the latent heat of chloroform is considerably smaller than the latent heat of acetone, and you need to produce vapor. So you need to produce a lot of vapor, and for that you need the liquid with the smallest uh, uh, latent heat, yeah? So in this way, we can observe the vapor layer produced there. With the other liquids also exist, but you cannot observe it because the amount of layer, well, the amount of liquid is not visual, uh, yeah? So to visualize the liquid, we use this ethylene glycol versus chloroform. And you notice there the first collision, so there is no, you cannot observe the vapor that is produced. They are in latent frost, but you cannot observe the vapor. But when they reach the very hot surface of ethylene glycol, there is a vapor layer produced at the contact, avoiding the collision. And then, and a second collision, again, it's coming, and you observe the vapor layer. So this confirms that our hypothesis was right. In fact, this is a picture, a lateral view, where you can observe yet ethylene glycol, and you, you observe the small liquid that is more volatile, and you can see that the vapor layer comes from this drop, from the droplet with the lower temperature, because it sees the hotter temperature as a latent frost surface. So it enters in latent frost state against this droplet also. And this explains uh, several things. For instance, dimethyl formamide, yeah, the, uh, water and formamide uh, coalesce directly. You can notice that formamide, in this case, has a larger boiling temperature than water. But water has the larger, the largest of all the latent heats. So you need a lot of, uh, you know, what you need a lot of uh, heat to be supplied to the water to produce vapor. So during this collision of formamide against water, water has to evaporate because it, it is the droplet with the, with the lower boiling temperature. So it is the one that will enter in latent frost, not the formamide. But water has the largest latent heat. So it cannot produce the considerable amount of vapor to produce the latent frost state with the formamide. And this is the reason why they coalesce directly. <clears throat> we develop a model to study the, well, as I explained to you, the moment of coalescence occurs when the droplet uh, that is bouncing evaporates up to the, a given size. And this size was of the order of the capillary length. So by using a model of evaporation that considers the amount of vapor that is produced in the gas layer between the droplets, minus the amount of vapor that is going out, considering a lubrication approximation for this uh, amount of liquid that is produced in that part. And then we can also estimate the generation of vapor per unit time. And then uh, we have this differential equation 
that can be put in uh, dimensionless numbers. And you can find in the moment of coalescence or, well, the moment at which the vapor layer attains a thickness of the order of, of 10 nanometers, at which intermolecular forces are uh, considerably significant. So you can estimate the moment of coalescence. We obtained that it was about twice the capillary length. <laughs> so the, this, these points are for each liquid. So this is the, 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 this with the properties of the liquid that we found in the literature, we obtained these values are larger than the capillary length that we estimated in the experiments. But as a first approximation, we believe that it was a, well, a good uh, first approximation explaining the, the, this size of the capillary length as the moment, uh, the size of coalescence. After the coalescence, you can observe quick mixing. For instance, if the liquids are miscible, like water and acetonitrile, you can observe explosions because if the difference in boiling temperature between the liquids is very large, like chloroforms inside ethylene glycol, in this case, then when the chloroform enters in ethylene glycol, it abruptly increases its temperature producing uh, 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 abrupt phase uh, transition and the explosion. But there were cases where the liquid were invisible, for instance, toluene and water, but they coalesce because in this way they decreases the surface energy, right? Because they become a single sphere. So they coalesce, but you can notice here, they coalesce, but you can notice that they remain separated. No? This one is the toluene and this is the water. Here, the, the uh, water, the toluene was uh, tinted with blue ink, and you can notice them that they remain separated. And because toluene is less dense than water, the toluene goes to the top of the liquid of the water droplet, and then you can transport the toluene inside the water droplet in later process state. And this can be useful because toluene is very toxic. So you, evaporating toluene uh, is uh, dangerous, but evaporating water is not. So you can put the toluene inside the water and transport it uh, on, on a ratchet, for instance. Okay, this is a summary of what we have done in this work. Uh, we show that uh, well, the, we determine the latent frost temperature for each liquid, yeah, and our relation between those late, latent frost temperature and boiling temperature. We show that the latent frost effect uh, occurs between the droplets, avoiding the direct coalescence, even when they are miscible. And the drops finally coalesce when one of them reaches a size similar to its capillary length because the droplet becomes spherical. And then when the, when, when the capillary, when surface tension domains, the droplet is spherical. And then the, the area of contact is very small and you cannot produce enough vapor to avoid uh, the coalescence, they coalesce. Well, this was uh, published uh, uh, well, in November 2019. Uh, and was covered on physical regulator, so we were very happy because of this experiment. Well, if I have time, I think I have. Uh, I, I have, right, Yuri? I can continue with the second yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. So now I, I'm gonna show you another experiment that we are performing now about the simultaneous discharge of liquid and grains from silos. So, like a two years ago, we started a studying what happened when you have liquids combined with grains. Because if you discharge water from a silo, this is, for instance, the clepsydra that it was a, the clepsydra that was a a, a liquid uh, our a liquid uh, a clock no? <coughs> that was uh, built to measure time like uh, five thousand years ago in Egypt, and the clepsania or our glass and glass we could think that is from Alexandria or something like that. But in fact, the only evidence that, it, uh, that exists in the literature is from the Middle Ages. But in the case of Clepsydra, you have hydrostatic flow. You know? So then you can use the continuity equation and the Bernoulli equation, for instance, for a, a Newtonian liquid, and obtain the velocity of the flow rate coming from the container as a function of the height of the liquid column above the orifice. So it is hydrostatic. It depends on the height of the of material above the orifice. But for the case of grains, for instance, in a sand glass, the flow is constant, independently of the height of the water of the sand column above the orifice. So this is can be estimated. The flow rate can be estimated using the Weber law, 
This Weber law was uh, pro uh, proposed about uh, 1962, and it depends on the diameter of the orifice, also depends on the diameter of the particles, but it doesn't depend on, a, on, on height, so it doesn't depend on H in this case. So this, in this case, is constant flow, and in this case, is hydrostatic flow. So the question is, what happens if you mix grains and liquid, and you discharge them simultaneously? This happens, for instance, while well, you, you in Brazil produce a lot of coffee. So in, in coffee industry, you have water uh, that used to, you know, to to wash the grains, and then there is the, this uh, process to to separate the pulp from the from the from the beans, and then you have here the the the, the seeds you know, that are washed also and discharged. Also, you can find it when 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 beach uh, is the, is the when, when there is drag of sand from the beach, you, you also have combination of grains. So we ex to study this experiment, we have a cylinder that is our silo. We put some sand inside water, and then we hang the system from a force sensor to measure the weight of the system as a function of time, what, when it is discharged. And we also uh, film with a high-speed camera to see how the level decreases. So for the case of uh, sand, dry grains, you have the constant flow rate. So the slope of this gives us the, the flow rate. So the flow rate is constant. For water, you have the red line that is hydrostatic. And for uh, grains, it depends, well, for the mixture, it depends on the size of the grains. For very small grains, about 100 microns, it is basically constant. Up to the moment, uh, the silo uh, well, all the grains end, and only have only you have the the water. So this is again hydrostatic. But the important thing is here. And then, if you increase the grain size, you go to another regime that is more hydrostatic. So you go for go for uh, static uh, for constant flow rate to hydrostatic flow rate. Uh, to model the system, we use the Darcy law. So the flow rate for the Darcy law. Imagine you have a porous medium. In this case, the porous medium in the Darcy law is uh, a porous medium of uh, of length L. In this case, of area A and a permeability cap. So the delta P is the difference in pressure between this that it would be the atmospheric pressure and the hydrostatic pressure that you have here. Then, uh, if you solve for delta P and using the Cosenic-Karman equation for the porosity, that is this term here, where epsilon is the, the porosity. That's equal to the one minus the packing fraction in the case of a granular material, where we propose that would be the porosity will be given like that. Th this is the height of the sand of the layer that is changing in time, yeah, and this is the velocity of the liquid relative to the velocity of the uh, of the sand that is also flowing. So this is the reason why we measure the sand level to obtain this velocity. Then, if you use the Bernoulli equation. That is this one, but in, but the delta p is given by this expression, so you obtain this one. This is the hydrostatic term. This is the hydrodynamic resistance, and this is the kinetic energy term, right, per unit volume. So if you combine this equation with the continuity equation, in this case, using the the fact that you have grains at the at the opening, so you will have only uh, a smaller available area for the liquid to flow. And then you can solve it numerically yeah, and obtain a solution for uh, for the height of the sand level as function of time, multiply it by the density, by gravity you can obtain the volume, and then you can have the mass as a function of time. And then show uh, this is the mass remaining in the container as a function of time, the well, the the these uh, solid points corresponds to the experiments, and these straight lines corresponds to the solution for the case of one uh, orifice. So this was published about uh, 2018. We published this, and we say, okay, this is the case for, of one orifice, and we can see that our model, even when it is a very simple model, is able to reproduce uh, reasonably well what we observe in the experiment. What happens now? For more orifices, that is the problem that we wanted to to study now. So 
So this is the experiment is the same basically, but now you have n orifices here. I'm showing only the case of two in the sketch. Because okay, if you have one orifice, for instance, for water, okay, you have a given time tau. If you have two orifices, the time for discharge, these are pictures taken from uh, this time. Uh, 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 th these are snapshots that are taken, and then you produce these uh, profiles. No? This is the this line corresponds to the liquid level, how it's decreasing on time. So time is in this horizontal edges. And you can hear here the time is tau. So for two or if for one orifice is tau, for two orifices is tau over two. If you repeat the experiment with, with dry grains only, then you have a given time tau here at the end of the discharge. And you can notice also that two orifices you have tau over two. So this is expected. No? Imagine you have a tank, and in the tank, uh, you, you, you take one hour to discharge with, with one hole. And I ask you, how, how long will it take to discharge the tank with two orifices? You will say, OK, you, with two individual orif with two in, uh, orifices, it will have only one uh, half an hour, right? So it's tau over two. And that happens for water on dry grains. We agree with that. When we you put water and grains, then you observe here that the, the silo runs out grains at a given time. But then when you put two orifices, the time for discharge is not half the time for one orifice that would be here, but it's considered large. In fact, if you increase the number of orifices, you observe that the time to discharge, for instance, here for one orifice is the blue one, is about 30 seconds. For two orifices is about 24. For three orifices, identical orifices are around 20. And for four orifices, only 19 seconds, something like that. So it saturates the time for discharge as you increase the number of orifices. This is shown here in this plot. For different grain sizes, yeah, as a function of n, the orange line is what you expect. But what we observe is that when you increase the number of orifices, the flow rate decreases, and then it becomes basically a little bit more than the flow rate for one orifice, and it saturates. So how do you explain that? This is the expected one, as I said, and this is the real one, where the flow of n orifice is considered smaller than n times the flow of one orifice. So to explain that, our hypothesis, in fact, uh, we are working on that now, is that the mixture, because you have small particles, the, even when they are not, uh, they are uh, sedimented in the water. They are not flow. This is not a colloidal suspension or something like that. They are sedimented. But even in that case, because they are flowing, is there is a small time at which they, you can consider that they are suspended, and they they uh, behave as a non-Newtonian liquid with a sure thickening behavior. So in a Newtonian liquid, if you uh, plot the shear stress versus shear rate, you will find that the, there is a this given by this equation. This is the formation, the below, uh, the, the <coughs> this is the gradient of velocity on the flow, no? and this is the, con the the constant between the shear stress and the velocity is a mu that is the viscosity. So for Newtonian liquids, this is constant. But for non-Newtonian liquids, for instance, for for paint, no? that is a shear thinning, you can start uh, moving the paint, the, the paint, no, at the beginning. And then the viscosity is very high, but when you move it, it is viscosity decreases. But in the case of shear thickening, for, is, for instance, uh, cornstarch, when you uh, deform the cornstarch very slowly, the cornstarch is, is, is like a fluid, so the viscosity is small. But if you do it very hard, for instance, if you try to heat in cornstarch, it becomes a solid because the viscosity remains very, uh, the viscosity increases considerably. So our explanation is that something happens like that in the in our mixture. When you try to increase the number of orifices, it's equivalent to try to deform the mixture more uh, quickly, and then the viscosity increases. So the viscosity appears in our model in this term, in the resistance, in the hydrodynamic resistance. So what we, we did is uh, increase the viscosity for the mixture for one orifice, we have one value. And then for two orifices, we increase the viscosity for three orifices and so on. And we observe that by doing that, we are able to reproduce the experiments that are the color lines with the dashed lines that are the model, increasing 
the viscosity. So apparently our explanation of uh, well, our model working with an increasing viscosity considered non-Newtonian liquid is able to reproduce the experiment. This is a work that is performed by my student, my master science student, Daniel Rodriguez. So it's in process, we haven't published this, but it's something that we are doing in our laboratory. Well, uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge, I had another experiment, but I, I don't have time to, to, to show it. So I'm gonna stop here. This is the people that has been working in silo discharge, Andrea Cervantes, that performed the PhD in 2018, doing the first experiment also with granular bubbles. I, that is the experiment I wanted to show, but uh, I, had, I had time. She's now a, a, a researcher at UADI here in Mexico. Daniel Rodriguez, that is my master science student. Luis Elizondo, that is helping also with the models, a postdoctoral researcher in Grace Lab. This is for the silo discharge. And for the triple latent first effect, the first part is Jason Palacio, that was a master science student, and uh, with two colleagues from uh, UDLA and from the University of Poitiers in France, uh, Florian Moreau and René Ledesma. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Conacyt for the financial support, <laughs> and you can find more information in my website. And thank you all of you for your uh, presence in this conference. Thank you, Felipe. Right, so do we have questions, comments? Uh, uh, Antoine, do you want to go ahead? Can you, do you have a micro there, a microphone there? Let me, let me, let me mute here. I can, I can't hear. Can you hear me, Felipe? Yes, now I can yes. hear you. Nice. Okay, thank you very much for the, the very nice talk. Uh, my question is about uh, the Leiden frost effect. You mentioned the Leiden frost temperature, but in the, in the graph you showed, there is also a distribution in the uh, evaporation time. And I wonder yes. if uh, the efficiency of the Leiden frost effect, if we can call it like that, is different yes. from different uh, liquids, for instance, uh, like the, the time to evaporate in the Leiden first state compared to the evaporation time before we reach this, this yes. Uh, state. Yes, yeah, the efficiency, as you mentioned, it is different because it depends on the latent heat of the liquid. In fact, it has been already, it's already known that for the case of a single droplet, this, this uh, plot is for a single droplet on the substrate, right? So each droplet there uh, for different liquids has different physical chemical properties. For instance, they have different uh, latent heat. No? They, they have uh, different heat capacity. It also depends on the vapor layer thickness, and it depends on the density of the liquid, for instance, because more dense liquids produce uh, less, uh, uh, well, uh, the thickness of the vapor layer is smaller because of the competition, because uh, with the weight of the droplet, etc. So it depends on the different factors. But this is well known, there are models to uh, estimate the evaporation time for uh, single droplets. So uh, they depend on different uh, uh, pro uh, properties of the liquids, and this is the reason why you have different evaporation types. But here you can notice that water, for instance, has considerably larger uh, evaporation time, because I, as I showed you before in this table, the latent heat of water is considerably higher than for the rest of the liquids. Yeah? So this is the reason why for water, you have a considerable larger evaporation time. Okay, thank you very much. I don't much. know if, I, if, that, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, thanks for your question. Thank you, Antoine. Do we have more questions? I have a question regarding the light and frost effect as well. When you yes. first, when you were introducing the, uh, the, the problem, my first yeah. uh, uh, thought was that there was some sort of Marangoni effect related to gradients of surface tension. So is there an internal distribution of temperature in the grains that can cause non, uh, let's say, uniformity of surface tension across the surface that would probably make the capillary length something difficult to assign to a drop? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, Yuri. Thanks for the question. Uh, yes, in fact, people have shown that there is a convection effects inside the droplet, so they have put some. I I, I couldn't hear exactly the question because it, there was some noise. So people probably from the from the audience online also had the same problem. But if I I understood well, you said that if there were some convection inside the droplet that could change the 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 surface tension and then. Yes, uh, capital would be difficult to uh, to determine. Yeah, that 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 the convection of, uh, convection effects they exist. People have put some particles, you know, for some markers inside the droplets, and they have still single droplets, and they observe this convection convection rolls inside the droplet. So it mm. exists. Uh, we are not considered that in the model. In fact, we are con we are calculating the capital length as a normal people do. <laughs> But uh, yeah, probably if that happens, that could help us to understand why our model of evaporation is not able to determine that the capillary length is the size of a, of coalescence. Mm. Perhaps uh, probably that, that could be interesting to to include in our model. We haven't done that, mm. but uh, yeah, because. Honestly, uh, while I was working most of the time in granular materials, <laughs> so I, I didn't realize when we built this uh, with these liquids. This, in fact, this is my my second publication related to fluid dynamics. <clears throat> but uh, I, I haven't realized that that uh, capillary length could be changed because of these convection yeah, rolls. Yeah. But probably considering that would be interesting. Very good. Yeah. Very probably. Good. It would, it would be good to, to discuss with you about that. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. Any more yes. questions? I, I I have a quick question, Felipe. I lost the first part of your uh, description of the uh, collapse of the cratering, and you mentioned yes. the ray formation. I lost that, so so apologies if I'm asking a question that you mentioned. But uh, is there a link between the shape of the object that is penetrating the granular media? And the number of rays that you generate? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, we perform experiments with the spheres with some uh, protuberances to to different number of convexities, no? uh, uh, concavities. And then we found for, that for for each concavity, you have one ray. Yeah. For instance, in this case, I, I don't know if I have the video here. Sorry, I don't have it. Let me check if I have one video that was. No, no, I, I have in this presentation. But let me probably I have another presentation where I can show you better the. For instance, uh, just let me see uh, this one. It's going to take one minute. Oh, sorry. Yes, probably here. You see, if you have a spherical projectile, you don't have rays, right? Because the ejection of material is uh, is continuous. Yeah, you have a continuous uh, curtain of ejected material. It's axisymmetrical. Yeah, axisymmetrical. But if you have some protuberances like this one. You can see that yeah. between the protuberances, you have these concavities. So between the protuberances, you have concavities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you have ray systems, right? The, there is a blackboard at the bottom, so you can see these rays, right? So we perform experiments with different number of protuberances because from this part, for instance, the material that is ejected is always ejected normal to the to the surface of the projectile in the mm -hmm. equator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the material that is uh, ejected from this part in this direction collides with the material that is ejected from this part, and this generates the rays. Mm. Now, if you have a protuberance that's very close to the other one, like this one, the ejected this ray will converge with this ray and will form a larger ray. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we show that uh, this is the mechanisms that produce rays in the case of uh, of protuberance. Even for instance, for this. Uh, See a star shaped projectile. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. you can notice four mm -hmm. rays coming come each one from this part. No? Because nice. 45 nice. degrees, the, the, the ray will be ejected. And we counted with different number of protuberances, and we were able to obtain 
uh, uh, in fact, well, and this is the video I just show, showing the two rays in this case. It would be easier to show in this part, right? Okay. Very good. Thank you, yeah. Philippe. It was a very, very nice video, very nice uh, talk. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments, Philippe? Well, in that case, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I, 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 uh, thank you very much, Yuri, for the invitation. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, last, last year I had here something about our experience, so I decided today to show more something not about our co collaboration that is in process now. Very but, good, uh, yes. For yes. In, in my part. It was very nice, and uh, we really enjoyed the, 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 uh, the, uh, the presentation of the university as well, the, the campus and all that. Uh, hopefully, at some point, we can, uh, we can go there and you can come here, and it will be very nice. Felipe, yeah, thank you so good. much. Thank you so much for this talk. It was very nice, very nice seeing you, even though if it was uh, online. Um, I think we should thank our speaker again. Sorry for not being there, but as you know, I had some troubles here. So yeah, yeah that's fine. It. That's fine. Thank you very much, Felipe. We'll leave you to it. Thank you. Bye bye. All the best. Thank bye bye. Thank See you. you. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> what? No, I feel like eating tacos. <laughs> tacos and, and chiles. <laughs>